Let's jump into uh, the Jets class. Uh, really exciting. And it all started at number two with Zach Wilson, the quarterback out of BYU. Um, we're now the first team in the modern era to take two quarterbacks in the top three picks of the draft within a four-year span. Wilson was terrific last year, 33 touchdowns, 10 rushing to just three interceptions. Kayla, Clay and I have talked ad nauseum about Zach Wilson over the last month. It feels like all we've talked about. I was wondering if you could give us your perspective on what you thought about Wilson as a player, whether he was your quarterback too, and if that's where you were hoping they'd go with the number two pick. Yeah, so I think that for me, I try not to get too excited about the quarterbacks pre-draft because you see every year there's five that could be pros and then really none of them pan out the way that you think that they will. And it turns out like a one or two every year end up being the guy um, and end up being successful with the team that they were drafted by. So for me, um, I tried not to get too attached to any single one and tried to find some of the positives across the board and some of the guys that the Jets could end up with. Um, for me, I only saw Trevor Lawrence as the surefire thing. And obviously a lot of people felt that way. Um, but I think that this season I was more trusting of what the Jets were going to do as opposed to in years past. Uh, I liked a lot of the traits I saw in Zach Wilson. One of the things I talked about on Pace's playbook is his accuracy this past season. Uh, I mean, breaking the BYU single season completion percentage record, 73.5% completion percentage. I know a lot of people were so concerned about the strength of schedule that they faced at BYU last, last season. But at the end of the day, your opponent doesn't affect your accuracy. You're either accurate or you're not. And so that trait alone is big. And going into the NFL with that skill I think that's a huge factor, especially after watching Sam Darnold, to be totally honest. I mean, he, not that I'm a big Sam girl. I love him. I hope he fans out. I hope he does really well. But you watch all those interceptions, and then you watch Zach Wilson, who threw three interceptions and 33 touchdowns, and you're like, okay, well, it doesn't matter if his opponents are FCS. He knows where to put the ball. He doesn't have the most skilled receivers in the world being at BYU, and they're still catching everything because it's landing right in their hands. So I think his accuracy was kind of something that made me very excited. And I also like Zach because he's kind of, I think, the prototype of why college football should continue to have players have to play for three years or have to at least develop for three years in college because he – as you watch his snaps increase over his three-year career at BYU, you see how he adjusts to the game, becomes like the main guy under center, and um, he just he knows what he's doing. And you see like the growth literally in his stats year by year. As soon as his um, reps doubled in year two, he struggled a little bit. Once he was established and was used to getting that kind of playing time, he was great. He was awesome at BYU, so fun to watch. Watched a ton of his play. I'm excited about him. I think he has a lot of potential. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that he's going to be the guy, and I'm 100% sure, because we all have to watch it play out. But I am very excited about what he brings to the table, and I don't think he was a fluke. Uh, an incredible junior year. I think we can all agree with that. BYU making their case for QBU. He joins Jim McMahon and Steve Young as first-round picks out of BYU. Clay, a difficult question, I know. What are your expectations, though, for Zach Wilson, maybe in comparison to Sam and how the first year of his uh, rookie deal went? What are kind of some some things you're looking out for or some, some, some benchmarks you want to set for Zach Wilson in his rookie season? Well, going into the year, I mean, I kind of expect them to be more of a run-heavy offense. I don't think they're going to put too much on this plate in year one. But the biggest difference, and I know we've spoken about this, is that this is a much better offense than Sam Darnold's walking into. And Darnold had Robbie Anderson, Quincy Noma, Jermaine Kearse, Terrell Pryor. Like, those are okay names at best. Whereas Fort Davis, like, he's coming off a career year. Uh, granted, it was under 1,000 yards, but you can't – the stats don't always tell the numbers. Denzel Mims should take another step forward as a second-round rookie. Jamison Crowder, we know what he can provide as a slot receiver. And Elijah Moore, who – I mean, we're going to get into that in a little bit. He can provide uh, immediately to the offense. So he's already stepping into a much better offensive system. We we hope that LaFleur is an actually a good play caller. He might be a smart mind, but we still don't know what he yep. is a play caller. But I do think he's still going to run the ball more often, just like Sam Fran did. And obviously, I think Green Bay would if they didn't have one of the greatest quarterbacks of all time. So I think they're going to be kind of kind of hiding him in a sense, uh, just let him grow into the game. Uh, I, I don't think too much is going to be put on his plate. I just hope that he's accurate with the ball, he doesn't look too scared in the pocket, and he continues to make those wild plays that we've been accustomed to seeing, especially over this last 2020 season. 
Are you telling me you weren't impressed with the 2018 Jets they ran out against the Bears with De- Deontay Burnout and Jermaine Curse and those guys that didn't do it for you? Uh, I mean, I, I was feeling pretty good about it <laughs> until they went against the Vikings. I think, wasn't that like the next week? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was an unfortunate little run of events for Sam Darnold. But we've moved on to Zach Wilson. That was a fairly you know expected pick for, for everyone across the league. Where it got a little interesting for us was the trade up to number 14 in the first round with Minnesota. The Jets took Elijah Vera Tucker, safely can call him Clay's guy throughout the entire process. The guard well, should be a guard for the Jets out of USC. Um, I think we all kind of anticipated that Joe Douglas could move up in that 19 to 21 range, target Tevin Jenkins. The fact that he went to 14 was, was kind of shocking. Um, we mocked AVT and Wilson to the Jets last week, Clay, on the show. Um, they secure the best interior offensive lineman in the class. Kayla and I were live uh, for the Play Like a Jet, a new stadium draft show. So we kind of saw our reactions. But when the Jets moved up to number 14, what was going through your head, Clay? And how confident were you that it was your guy, AVT, at number 14? So I was actually on Discord with a couple of my buddies. I would do this thing every year for the draft. And, uh, and my one friend, he was like maybe like 15 seconds ahead of me. He's like, the Jets traded up. I'm like, what? <laughs> Jets traded up. The Jags? No, the Jets traded up. <laughs> I'm like, no way. Wait, wait. So once I knew it was them, like my, I actually realized what was happening. I knew ABT was a pick 1,000%. I was so confident in it because, like, we know, like, we know their tax situation's pretty good right now. Obviously, fans not the long term, but it's still pretty good. Whereas the guard situation is just brutal. And Elijah Vera Tucker, I think he's just head and shoulders above every interior lineman in the class outside of, say, Landon Dickerson, but he has his own set of issues. So I just I knew that ABT was the pick. I'm I was so ecstatic. I was like doing like the whole like I was doing like J.R. Smith celebration from three points. And I was doing everything in my living room. I was going crazy. And I don't care if people make fun of me. I I love the pick. I'm so happy with Elijah Vera Tucker. I don't care. It's not the, that it's not the sexy pick, but it's the right pick. You're protecting your asset that you used. Getting uh taking Zach Wilson. We didn't do that in the past. We need to do it now. And I'm just so, I was so thrilled with it. As you can tell, I'm still giddy. <laughs> <laughs> I had a similar reaction, actually, because we were live, as I just mentioned, with Play Like a Jet and New Stadium for the draft show. And Kayla said, oh, my God, the Jets traded up. And my audio was cutting in and out. And I completely lost what she said. And I just jumped on Twitter because I was like, oh, my God, I have no idea what's happening. And uh, was pretty surprised as well. Kayla, looking back on the trade now, as, as everything's kind of settled down, are you happy with the aggressive move that Douglas made to go up and get Vera Tucker to secure his guy? Or, you know, in hindsight, as easy as it is to say, would you have rather them stay at 23 and maybe keep those third round picks? Yeah, I mean, at the time, I was a little surprised it was such a high up move. I didn't necessarily think it needed to be at 14. But looking back on it, I mean, what's the opposite of aggressive? You just sit there and be passive. I would rather go up and get the guy that you think is going to make the difference. Like I said before, I'm trusting what they wanted to do in that front office. I like who's there. I like who is making the choices finally. So I think that it's um, a great move. You looking back, I mean, I wanted a guard in free agency and we didn't end up with one. So we're kind of at the point where the draft was really the last resort if we were going to beef that up before this season started. And no, the Jets are not going to be fixed in this one off season, but that was the right move to make. Um, I'm really happy to see that the team is going after what they want so strongly and not mopping up the leftovers or overpaying free agents begging them to come because that's kind of an old tired approach at this point and uh, you got to build from within. So I'm excited about it. Plus I'm a big like, Going into this season, going into the 2020 season, before all of this went down with Sam and how bad everything was, um, I wanted Penny Sewell. Like, that was already the player that I thought that I wanted. I was all about, like, let's build up the offensive line. So using that pick for that, um, that's great with me. Uh, I think the Jets didn't give up too much either. If you look at what the Bears had to give up, obviously it was for a quarterback and it makes it a little bit different, but they gave up a first and a fourth. The Jets only gave up a third and then a pick swap moving down about 45 spots from a third to a fourth rounder. So like the value there, I think everyone is is really happy with the two picks. And that took us to day two, Jets picking early. There were some rumors would they trade down uh, to try and recoup some of the value they lost in the AVT trade. JOK was still on the board, a number of guys like that. They ended up taking Elijah Moore, which is a pick that Man, as I've watched more and more of him post-draft, I've fallen in love with this guy. He led college football in yards and receptions per game this year, um, doing it in the SEC. And over the past two years, he has nearly 1,800 yards from the slot, uh, which is the most in college football. 
by the sounds of the, the conversation they had on draft day, they were going to take him at 23 if they didn't trade up. So, uh, Kayla, there were some really good players available for the Jets at number 34. Uh, Tevin Jenkins, Asante Samuel, JOK. Who would you have taken with the pick? Were you happy with Elijah Moore? And do you think he's going to excel here? Yeah, so I don't think that Elijah Moore was who I had in my head or who I was expecting them to take. Um, I certainly think it was a great value talent-wise. Um, I would have taken Tevin Jenkins going back to the offensive line. That's what I would have wanted to do. I just think that the Jets, even with these improvements that they've made, are still lacking a little bit in terms of depth at the position. I wasn't particularly impressed with anyone I saw last year playing. So hopefully those guys will take a step up. And Tevin Jenkins would have been my go-to. But at this point, I think that Elijah Moore adds a lot to the team. I mean, I've watched so much of him being a big SEC football fan myself. Um, he's the kind of guy where when I'm typing up research packets for CBS, you have to like do a double check on his stats because you're like, did he do that three weeks in a row? Did he Has he done this every week all season? Like, it's kind of unbelievable when you look at what he was able to do. I actually watched your um, film breakdown of him, Luke, and just re-watching it over and over again, it's like, how does he do this every game? How does he put opponents like, he just, he spins them around. It's crazy to watch. And I think that he'll be a great fit. I hope it doesn't mean the loss of Jameson Crowder, but hey, I mean, you got to take what we can get at this point. I like that we're starting young and building up and it seems like a good sign to me. Yeah, Taylor, I tend to agree. Tevin Jenkins was the guy I really wanted. Obviously, sound like there were some things off the field, not with issues as far as he did things wrong, but maybe just some personality red flags that people saw in the draft process. Kayla, I need to clear your name here. You just mentioned CBS Sports. There are okay. a few graphics rolling around on Twitter that uh, are pretty prevalent in New York. The first one's sure. Emmanuel Quickly, who got a D plus for the grade, and the Jets getting a C plus in the grade. Can you confirm that you weren't part of those graphics? I certainly was not part of that. <laughs> no, so basically the way CBS is broken down, like it's all called CBS Sports, but there's like several companies and brackets within. I do all of like um, like the TV broadcast stuff. So anything up on the website, not related to me. Um, I do all the stuff like um, like the graphics you see during NFL and college football games. We, we pitch ideas for that. Uh, we give ideas to like the talent in their ear while they're live. Um, a lot of like halftime show of work and stuff like that. So no, that's definitely not me. <laughs> Perfect. That, that's excellent news. Uh, throwing to you for a second, Clay, I know you watched more kind of gash your gators in the first week of, of this year's college football season. I think he had over 200 yards. I had this crazy comp. I see a lot of Antonio Brown in his you know movement skills, his route running, his burst and acceleration. Am I insane for that? And what do you think about Moore and his skill set in general? Yeah, I mean, I think he's going to be a good fit in the slot, but he can also play on the outside. I don't think his, his size is really going to stop him from playing anywhere on the field. <clears throat> Excuse me. If you want to play him on the outside, inside, you can throw him in the backfield. I mean, we all we know like the backfield still doesn't have a ton of names, so you can throw him anywhere around the field in year one, especially if we still have Jameson Crowder, and he will be a valuable chess piece to uh, Michael Floor in this offense. I, I'm so, I was so excited with the pick. Like I expected them to trade back, actually, um, considering how many big names were still on the board. I, I thought they were going to try to move back into like the early, mid-40s and still potentially get a Tevin Jenkins or a Koromoa or a Samuel or maybe Elijah Moore falls even more. But, again, with the first pick, uh, with the, the uh, ABT pick, they traded up got with conviction and got their guy. And they stayed here. They might have gotten some picks, uh, some trade offers that they liked, but they had the conviction to take a guy that they were seemed like they were going to target at 23 if ABT wasn't there. So they got three guys in the top 25, two guys in the top 10 in the first three picks. I, I'm ecstatic. I think Moore is going to be a great, a great piece to this offense. Yeah, and do you really have to show these Gator highlights right now? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, I, I love Elijah Moore, and honestly, I've, I'm sure you guys saw it too. The AJ Brown clip of him just hysterically crying. Uh, just saying, like, you're better than me. You're better than me. And if he's any better than A.J. Brown, <laughs> let me tell you, I think every single Jet fan would be ecstatic with this selection. I mean, he's going to be – I think he's going to be a star in New York. Uh, ho hopefully on the field he becomes that Odell Beckham that the Jets never had. Yeah, there it is, like the, the viral video of A.J. Brown and Elijah Moore, former teammates at Ole Miss. I, yeah, I mean, I can't. I can't really say much more. I'm losing words of like how excited I was for Elijah Moore. 
Yeah, seems like a really plus character type of guy as well. Obviously, you saw the the clip with AJ Brown and what he thinks of him. Kenny Yaboa, who the Jets got in undrafted free agency, spoke extremely highly and said that was a factor of of why he came to New York. I'm sure the the big money for an undrafted free agent helped as well. Let's squeeze one more guy in uh, before we go into winners and losers, guys. And we're going to talk about the first Michael Carter that the Jets selected. So they didn't have a pick from 34 to 107. I'm sure like me, Kayla and, and Clay, you were you know sitting there just dreading the rest of the second round as the Jets just watched a lot of good players at guard and, and positions like that just kind of slip by. Finally got to 107. They stood pat. They didn't give up any more mm-hmm. draft assets. And they took Michael Carter, the running back out of UNC. Uh, Clay, Carter was a guy that we discussed at the Jets for 66, for 86. We mocked him on the show last week for the Jets, I believe, at 86. I'm guessing you were a pretty big fan of the pick. And going to bed on Friday night, in your mind, was it Jabril Cox versus Michael Carter? And where were you hoping they would go? Yeah, like starting with that first thing, like we, yeah, we mocked him to 66, 86. And I'm pretty sure the Jets front office did the same exact thing. I don't think they ever expected Michael Carter to fall here in their wildest dreams. So the fact that they get an instant impact player at running back, a position that was much needed on this team at 107, I think is a huge home run for them, in my opinion, and I'm sure a lot of people's opinions. Yeah. Um, and I'm sorry, what was the second question? <laughs> uh, when you went to bed on Friday night, knowing yeah. the Jets were picking second, yeah. obviously Jacksonville weren't going to take a running back. <laughs> you wouldn't think so anyway after they already took Travis Etienne. Was it Jabril Cox versus Michael Carter for you? Yeah, I, I thought it was going to be one of those two. I mean, I, we were speaking all throughout that day too, um, kind of just like narrowing down the names that could potentially make it to 107. The, the list kept getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Like, I was hoping that one of the two cornerbacks could make it. Um, it was uh, the cornerback from um, – man, I'm drawing a blank right now. Who's the one that we kept the, the bigger one? Uh, oh, uh, Ify Melfonbu. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, I'm drawing a blank there. Sorry, he's on the jet. But uh, <laughs> no, I was I was expecting him to fall. I was hoping he could. Um, and obviously, he didn't. But I was more than happy with Michael Carter. I knew it was going to be him or Jabril Cox. But apparently, there's still some issues with Cox and his medicals that teams just weren't comfortable with. Oh, that's Michael Carter on Michael Carter violence right there. <laughs> but we caught that. But uh, no, I, I was extremely happy with this big. I think he's going to be uh, versatile in this running back uh, system. I mean. I think he fits the wide uh, wine zone scheme. He's he's got an incredible vision. I, that that play right there was amazing, and, and I think we kind of see it here. He gets that uh, the cutback lane right there, just making all those guys miss for the touchdown. I mean, the vision is insane. He's honestly one of the better ones uh, in that department in this draft class. So I'm ecstatic with this pick. The offense has gotten so much better in the last week, and uh, I just I, I hope he's hit, man. <laughs> I just hope. Yeah. I know we've been feeling that way for a long time. This is uh this is a really promising draft class. I, I did a film breakdown on Michael Carter for play like a jets YouTube channel. Make sure you check that out. If I had to characterize him in three words, I'd say vision as clay just mentioned, I'd say elusiveness and short area quickness and then burst. Those three traits make him a really good running back. Kayla, I know you're a Gamecocks fan, so I don't want to spend too much time on UNC, <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, albeit they play in a different conference. Do you think Carter walks in and can get the lion's share of the touches in year one? And, and what was your overarching thoughts of his game? So I'll start out by saying South Carolina is the real Carolina and the real USC. And anyone who wants to find me on this, you know where to find me. <laughs> so that being said, I think that the trend in the NFL of running backs being taken later is just so immensely helpful for the Jets right now because this guy, I mean, he makes it look easy. Michael Carter running is just, it's ridiculous. The way he just turns people around every single run, it's absurd to watch. I'm actually really excited to see him play for the Jets because I didn't necessarily think they were going to go the running back route. I thought that they had a lot of guys that showed promise last year and it wasn't necessarily necessarily going to be a priority at any point but I'm glad that they I'm glad that they drafted him I thought that was a great pick at 107 the value is ridiculous um but I think that he's turned the Gamecocks around a couple times I mean I think that he's very promising though I, I it's a good pick um maybe not also what I would have done but I'm certainly not mad about it Yeah, that's perfect. That was 107 and Michael Carter. Let's jump to one more, if you don't mind, guys. We'll go to Jamie and Sherwood, uh, who was probably my least favorite pick 
uh, for the class as far as value. The Jets took him in the fifth round after a trade down at 146. He was a safety at Auburn um, who uh, is going to play linebacker for the Jets in the NFL. He'll play that weak linebacker slot. He was uh, ran a 475 at 215 pounds. Good athlete without being a tremendous athlete. On his call to a few of these guys, Robert Sala talked about wanting people who can run and hit, and that seemed to be a pretty consistent theme. I, I thought the Sherwood pick was okay. Um, I'm not sure where you guys were at with it, but Kayla, being an SEC girl, as we've mentioned, had you watched a lot of Auburn this year, and did you have any pre-existing thoughts on, on Sherwood as a player? Uh, my most exciting moment watching Auburn was when we beat them. Um, it was the only good South Carolina game I got to watch all year. Uh, but to be totally honest with you, um, I don't think he particularly stood out to me. Um, I mean, I saw today that he's going to be the first player to sign his contract of the draft picks. So clearly they're excited about him. Um, I guess we'll just kind of have to see how it pans out because clearly Salah has the defensive vision. So if he sees his guy and he thinks that he could make him into something that will work, then I'm all on board. Just show me. Yeah. This was the first of six defensive players that the Jets took after taking four offensive players to start the draft class. Clay, I love his versatility. That's one thing I'll say. Uh, according to PFF, uh, Sherwood had 28% of his snaps at inside linebacker, 27% at free safety, 16% in the slot, and just 6% at outside linebacker where he'll play in the NFL. Um, from a value perspective, though, Clay, how did you feel about the pick? Guys like Brevin Jordan still on board, uh, Jalen Moore, who you drafted to the Jets in a mock, Quincy Roche. There were a few guys I liked better. Where were you hoping they were going to go at 175 or 146, sorry, where they took Jamie and Sherwood? Yeah, I mean, I, after seeing that they went offense, 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 I figured defense had to be thrown in there at some point. Um, I, I was looking at names, like obviously, Brad, Brevin Jordan, you mentioned offense, Jalen Moore, offensive line. Uh, there's a couple names, like Cam, uh, Cam McGrone I was looking at, Shamar John, uh, John Charles from uh, Appalachia State I was looking at. So I was kind of thinking they would go defense, and Sherwood was a name I was not familiar with. But after watching the um, after watching his tape, like I told you before we start recording, I took the fan glasses off. I just wanted to evaluate the player himself. And value-wise, I thought it was maybe a little early in my opinion because this was only the second pick in the uh, fifth round. And I had a, I had a sixth-round grade on him. but And we're going to see what he's like at linebacker. And he's going to be playing a new position, so maybe he's better. And I completely trust Salah with linebacker. 